welcome. Good to see you guys. It was a good week, I hope, for you. And uh, it was a good week in Nevada. I mean, we got rain in California. We put out the fire and got rid of some smoke and had some nice days of sunshine. So, uh, Kent, this message goes out to you in Hawaii. And all those who, like Kent, have come back to the Lord or who don't understand yet the power, the simplicity, and the beauty of the gospel. Um, we're in the book of Romans. We're doing a series in the book of Romans. So we're in chapter 3 and week 3 this week. Uh, the backdrop of this series is really the righteousness of God. It's who He is. And unless we really truly know who He is and what He's about and how He thinks, feels, and what He says to us, which is why we believe the Word of God is his word and the authority for us to understand these things. Every one of us has an authority base, which you'll go to to help you answer questions about things of the heart, things of eternity, things of morality. And um, we believe it's a Bible, that God inspired it. And so God's righteousness, it says in the gospel, First uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17, that the righteousness of God is revealed. And so we have to understand his righteousness and his standard of righteousness. And then chapter 2 and 3 is our unrighteousness, Jew, Gentile, the whole world is under, right? Like we're not, we're not where God is and what he created us for in the beginning when we were without sin. He says, but if you do sin, it will separate us. Because in my presence is holiness, and my presence is righteousness, and my presence is perfection, and that's what I created you for. But now it's stained, it's tainted, it's polluted, it's corrupted. And so we got this problem, this chasm. And so what we do down here is we try and establish a different set of righteousness, different rules. It's called our own self-righteousness. And compare each other with one another and say, well, I'm better than most, or I'm better than you, therefore I'm okay with him. And God says, no, you're delusional. That's not the standard. This is the standard. You can be the best person on planet Earth and still be far from me. And this is the problem God came to solve, which we're going to talk about today. What is the solution? What is the provision that God has provided for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? And so let's pray. Father, we pray today that uh, if there's no other message we hear the rest of our lives, this would be the one. This is what Paul preached in every city he went, that we would never grow tired or weary of this old story. It's the truth. It's, it's what you did for us because of your love. It's what you did that we could never do. You made a way. But I pray that Today you would open the hearts and eyes of everybody in this room and everybody watching online that we might understand the beauty of it, the power of it, the simplicity of it. We might fall on our knees in gratitude, embrace it, receive it, because anybody in their right mind would never reject what you've done for us. Holy Spirit, do a work here this day in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, that would make a difference for all eternity. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many hope to go to heaven someday? <clears throat> Good, well, you're in the right place. Yeah, if you don't, you probably like, missed it on the left turn at McCarran. How many know they're going to heaven? Okay. How many would like to know? if you don't know already, right? You see, we're not supposed to live with this doubt or insecurity or in uncertainty, but yet we do in our heads. Um, so going back to, to Romans real quick, if you want, you can open your Bibles to Romans chapter three. You can take some notes on this or some note cards in the back of your for front seat cover. Uh, for the Jews then, you know, because God said that the Gentiles who didn't have the law, who didn't have a, a standard of righteousness, they sought to establish their own righteousness, and, and yet God gave the Hebrew nation a standard, right? His standard of righteousness, and, uh, and they couldn't keep it. And so Paul goes into this gospel that he preached all over the land that he says to the Gentiles in chapter 1 that your righteousness won't cut it. 
And then he jumps into chapter 2. Oh, and you, Hebrew nation, people of God, and religious folk, yours doesn't cut it either. So the question became for the Jew, well, then what benefit is there in being Israel? What benefit is there in having the law? What benefit is there? Do we benefit at all? And the, the issue is, yeah, you were given the righteous standard of God. You were given the law. You, through your lineage, there was a promise made to Abraham that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. And we know that Jesus, the Messiah, came through the lineage of Israel and of Abraham. And so there is a benefit, but it's only if you do the law. Well, Israel couldn't do the law. Nobody could. And so the law wasn't given to save them. The law was given to show them the standard and show, them how, show us how far we are off in our own self-righteousness, right? It's like, whoa, we can't do this. God's righteousness. And so chapter 3 opens up with this explanation that uh, we'll just read it, that there really is no benefit when it comes to salvation to just being Hebrews just being of the lineage of Abraham, unless, like Abraham, your righteousness is established on something other than your own works. Abraham was justified by faith, and chapter 4 goes into him as an example of what righteousness before God looks like. But chapter 3 is what we're going to deal with today. And so it opens up in uh, verse 9, we'll say this, What shall we conclude then? Do we Jews have any advantage? Not at all, for we've already made the charge that Jew and Gentile alike are all under the power of sin. This is our plague. This is our problem. This is the issue we have to solve. And the law did not solve that for us. You see? And your own self-righteousness and your works will not solve it for you. Next verse. As it is written... There's no one righteous on planet earth. There's not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Have together become, in God's sight, completely worthless when it comes to righteousness. There's no one who does good. Not one of us. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. Humankind. The poison of vipers is on our lips. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Each one of these is a different Old Testament passage of Scripture found in the covenant. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark, I'm just going to say, our ways. And the way of peace we have not known. Well, we can look at history and verify that, right? Or even modern day. There's no fear of God before our eyes. If you'll remember back in chapter 1 and 2 last week, it began there. We didn't think it was necessary to retain our knowledge of God. We didn't think it was necessary to give thanks or to honor Him. And so our our thinking became futile. We began to spin out of control because we lost our fear of God. We lost our connection with God, so our identity became confused. Like, who are we? And I guess I'll just compete and compare with the rest of you all and then figure out that that's my self-worth, that's my identity, because we don't know who we are on the planet without God. We were created in His image for His glory to be together in his presence and united with him. And without that, we're lost and confused. And if we don't retain our knowledge of God, that's again why we gather every Sunday and I encourage you to make it a priority in your life, then you're going to lose that. Like they didn't think it worthy to give thanks to him, to come before him and recognize him. And so we spin out of control. Next verse, now what we... Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, Israel, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. You Jews, Gentiles, without the law, everybody's going to stand before God and give an account. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And so the law became for Israel not a means of salvation, but actually became their judge and their condemnation because they couldn't keep it. Oh, dang, that's no good. I'd rather be a Gentile and not have the law and hopefully get by on my own kind of thing than have to give an account for not completing or fulfilling what God gave me to do. And so, um, go ahead and hold off on that next verse. Working for righteousness, working for God's approval. 
It's kind of like the guys, you know, three guys competing to swim across the Pacific. It's like, uh, hey, I can do it. I can swim better than you. It's like my own right, you know. And so, yeah, one makes it five miles, one makes it 10 miles, one makes it 15, they all die. It's like, yeah, you weren't even close, right? It's like you trying to work for your own righteousness. You've got to understand this. And so here's the question that becomes a sort of a clear indicator of where I am, what I'm hoping, trusting, will, when I say who wants to go to heaven and who hopes and who believes and who knows. It's like if you were to die right now and go to heaven, who's always at the gate, Peter says, hey, to you, why should I let you in? What would your answer be? Well, because I'm a good guy. Well, then that's where your hope is, in your own righteousness. Well, because I never killed anybody, because I'm better than Mike Stosick. Nobody's better than Mike Stosick, but, you know, if you said that, you'd be in air twice. And so, what would your answer be if you had to answer that question? Why should you be allowed into heaven? There's your answer. There's your hope. There's your trust. If it's your own righteousness, if it's not Jesus, if it's anything but Jesus, and that's that's God's solution, we'll get to that here in a minute, but anything but that will not suffice. And you need to know that now, today, because that will not work for you. So Romans 10, 1 through 3, Paul says about his own Israelites. He says, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for my own nation, the Israelites, is that they would be saved. This is what God did for us, that we would not be (laughs) answering for our own sins. I can testify about my people that they're zealous for God. They have a zeal. They call themselves spiritual. They try and do good, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God, They sought to establish their own, and they did not submit to God's righteousness. Question, what standard of righteousness are you submitting to? Are you trying to establish your own rules, regulations, and hold God accountable to that? Or do you understand that you're going to be held accountable to Him, and it's His standard of righteousness that matters? And I don't care what you think about yours. See, it's just this deception that we live in that has to be broken. And it will be one of three things for you. The gospel will either be foolishness to you, like it was to the Jew, offensive to you, like it was to the Greek, or the power of God for you, and the beauty. That's, you, you determine right now how this is sitting with you, right? The gospel, it says, is foolishness to the Gentile, sorry. It's, it's offensive to the Jew. But to those who are being saved, it's the power and the wisdom of God for the salvation of all who would believe and receive his grace by faith. That's the gospel. And so you can determine for yourself, like, what am I going to say to to Peter or to God when I get there? And how does this message sit with me today? I'm a good guy. That'll get me to heaven. No one will stand before God and boast that they made it there on their own merit. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you guys may know this verse, but if you don't, you should memorize it or at least put it in a frame somewhere where you can see it every day. Uh, It's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it's a gift. God is not obligated. He owes you nothing. It's a gift. By his own mercy and grace, he decided he would do this for us. And then he offers it to us, free. Well, I don't want to do that. No, you've got to swallow your pride to receive that, sure. So that no one may boast before him. It says, this is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast before him. Our only boast is in him, in our gratitude. You know how I know if you get it, and this is how you will know if you got it, right? That um, the evidence 
that you understand this gift, that you fully grasp its implications, will be seen in your lifestyle of worship and gratitude. You see, when you understand this, it will transform your very soul, mind, and heart. It will break you down, and the only thing you can do when you understand the power, the beauty, the simplicity is to live a life of worship the rest of your days. Whatever God asks is not too big. Whenever God asks is not too late in the evening. When God speaks, you respond because you are so (laughs) blown away that he overcame everything for you. It's not with precious metal, silver, or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that was handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Spotless, sinless. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And he offers it by his grace as a gift. And the only way you can receive it is in humility and faith. And here's the deal, you know, we go, oh yeah, cool, thanks Jesus, you know, I'll take that. And uh, I got my heaven card, got my ticket to heaven, Jesus, woo You don't understand it. If your life doesn't change, you have just, you might, I, I would challenge you to question your salvation. That you just don't yet get it. You don't understand it. And I pray today it would cut, the lights would come on for you. Because you've heard this message maybe since you were a kid, right? But then there's that one day where it's just like, and the first thing you have to realize for that to happen is that your righteousness compared to his, it's last week's message, go back and listen to it, your unrighteousness has really, you're not cool and God doesn't say, oh, I'll I'll give him a free free card because she's a nice guy and because oh, you know what, I've done a few bad things, I'm going to do a few good things to kind of erase them, and then it'll balance out in the scales. That's your own self-righteousness again. That's not the way God works. Your good works will not over-erase your sin. Do all the good you want. It still doesn't erase your sin. You still stand before God guilty. Which is why you're going to understand these next few verses that Paul goes into about redemption and atonement and understanding what is it that that means that there's a price on your head because of your own actions, words. And that price had to be paid either by you or by somebody else. Well, guess what? There's nobody else on the planet worthy of paying that price. Well, I'll pay for you. No, you can't. You're guilty too. You see, there was only one worthy to pay that price. That was the price of your redemption. You were bought off the slave block. You were a slave to sin, and he paid the price for your freedom. And now he says, be free, but be free to live for righteousness. And so the evidence that you get this will be seen in your life of worship. It will break you, but the place to start is your own unrighteousness and unworthiness, and if you don't get that in your head, then you're confused, deceived, and you won't get it, and this will be offensive, and this will be foolishness to you. But when you see clearly the way God sees, and the way Paul preaches, the way the gospel is shared, then you've got to go, that's me. I have no righteousness of my own. And in fact, my righteousness is unrighteousness. What am I going to do about that? I'm not going to cry out for justice, because then I'm condemned. I'm going to cry out for mercy. He who has been forgiven much, loved much. I mean, I did some rotten stuff. That's why. (laughs) Like Paul, the worst of sinners. But you know you. You know your stuff. The enemy's always in your face, in your ear, with all your condemning you. And God says, I know it too, but I'm not the one condemning you. I'm the one reaching out to save you. Now, would you... And so sometimes we go, well, why Jesus only? And that's so my, you know, so, so you know, narrow-minded. And you Christians, you're just so, you know, and it's like, no, you don't understand. We were helpless, locked up, and the only one who could came and opened the door that we might be set free. And we're going to sit around in our jail cell and say, no, I don't want to walk through that door because I don't, 
No, 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 I'm going to try and find my own way out. It's like, why would you do that? Somebody just came and set you free. What, who in the right mind wouldn't just run out of the jail? <laughs> oh, no, no, my pride says I don't want that. I'm going to do my, my own way. I don't want to submit to Jesus, so I'm going to do it my own way. You see, that's what we do. Oh, yeah, that's narrow-minded. There's a way out. And there's, guess what? There's only one way out. And you can whine about it, and you can complain about it, and you can try and find your own way out. But you won't. There's no other power on the planet Earth that says there's no other name given unto men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I am the door. He who comes to me will be saved. Through, walks through this door. It's not narrow-minded, it's glorious. It's simple, it's powerful, and it's like, duh. But we make it so complicated because of our pride and our own self-righteousness, and we're blinded by it. And if you don't humble yourself, you'll never see it for what it is. It will be offensive and foolish to you. But it's your own hard-hearted, blind self-deception. That's all it is. And that's why we pray that God would open our eyes. That's why Paul prayed in Ephesians, God, open the eyes of their heart that they might see the depth, the height, the breadth, the width of your love, that they might know it, that they might experience it. God, help us, because we are just blinded by our own self-righteousness. So Paul goes on in, the Ephesians, in, in Romans in verse 21. But now apart from the law, of righteous, the righteousness of God has been made known. To which all the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, the Bible testifies. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Like I said, that word redemption means that there was a price on your head and it was paid by his blood. That was the price. And again, when you capture and you grasp the beauty and the power and the simplicity of this, it breaks you that God's Son, sinless, is, was the price for my salvation. And he took that bullet for me, freely, willingly, that I might be set free. And put your name on that line, because that's what he did for you. Oh, God so loved the world, yeah, we genericize it or whatever, you know, make it. He loved the world. No, he loved you and died for you. And if you don't personalize it, it'll never make a difference. Like, this is you we're talking about, right? Who loves you more than you? You better start loving yourself pretty quick here. He died for you. Does that mean anything to you? Does that make a difference in your life? Only if you grasp that it's real and true. Eternal, powerful, and simple. Grace by faith. Now this faith issue is not just a mental ascent. Like, we've got to break this down too, right? It's like, okay, I'm just going to get my heaven card and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and then go about living my own life. He says, no, when you say yes to me by faith, there's this lordship issue that says now that you've overcome sin and been set free, don't longer be a slave, but be a slave of righteousness. Like, you just changed jerseys. Let's, you're playing for my team now. We just overcame darkness, sin, hell, Satan. I did it for you. You joined my team, right? Now, what are we going to do from here on out? Keep living for that guy? It's like... I'm sleeping with the enemy. It's like you said yes to me. We have been betrothed. We are one. We're like, and you're, what? Do you know what happened? Do you not know what happened right here at the cross? When you said yes by faith to the grace that I gave you, you I made you mine. That we might walk this thing out and start living for righteousness and push back the darkness that kept everybody deceived and that I was under that so that I may be free and live for 
truth and light and holiness and right. It's like, wait, wait, what am I doing? If you want to go back, and then go back. But you can't have both. And it's like, let's go. And so it's like when you struggle with sin, here's the issue. It's not a sin problem. It's a, it's a love problem. It's an understanding. I don't, what am I doing? Right? It's like, I got to go back to the cross. And I got to sit before the foot of the cross and watch Jesus bleed until I get it. And it breaks me so much that it's like, hell no. I'm never going back there. Because that's all it is. And I use that word intentionally, right? I'm going to live for him. That's my enemy. And my own sinful nature wants to do that. And I got to say no to that too. But guess what? It's not like I can overcome my flesh with my flesh. I got to overcome my flesh with the Spirit of God, what He's given me. He's given me a power source, His presence within me. And that's the second thing you got to do is study the Holy Spirit in your life. Can do for you. If you just, it's like, I'm not that smart of a guy. All I do, but I'm pretty wise. (laughs) All I got to do, I don't have to figure it all out. I just have to say yes every day to what Jesus says to do and walk with him. And if, and I go, that messes him up back there. That gives him no power over me. He says, only by the Spirit will you overcome the deeds of the flesh. So I live in the Spirit. I walk by the Spirit. I say yes to God every day. I I walk with Jesus. He's my advocate. He's my adversary. I got to make him my enemy and Jesus my friend in my own head. And then I got to trust him enough to follow him through whatever storms we go through in life. Because the enemy's going to make it hard. But you can overcome. Greater he's who's in you than he who's in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper because God is for me who can be against me. You see, now it's starting to make sense. And we just keep walking it out. And you don't have to be super smart. You don't have to be Einstein to do this and to overcome. You can be victorious and you can experience God's freedom. Not just from sin and hell and death, but everything that died in your life because of him. You're going to walk in freedom and victory. You see, things died in you. The enemy's killing things in you. Your dreams, the dreams God gave you, your your future, your identity, your worth, your joy, your peace, your freedom. He wants to kill it. He wants to take it away from you. He wants to take the sword away from you so you're no longer a powerful and victorious warrior, but you feel like you're, oh, I can't do that. And Jesus says, no, you can. In me, you can do all things. With me, nothing is impossible. It's like, wait, what? You see, you just got to keep walking it. All right, let's land the bird here. Verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because he left... The sins committed beforehand unpunished because he was preparing to bring his son. So he didn't deal with them. He just rolled them away. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness also at the present time so as to be just in the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. It was justice that was paid. Righteousness was done and imputed to you, offered to you. His blood covers you in your sin that you might be free. That God doesn't hold your sin against you any longer. That you can look forward to seeing him face to face. You can like look forward with joy, it says, to seeing him. You don't have to worry about, and there's another good, you know, take the test like, what do you think about when you see God? Is that an exciting thought or is that a scary thought to you? It would only be a scary thought if you don't know that your sins have been forgiven. If you know that he's forgiven you and accepted you in Christ Jesus, then you're like, and when you stand before him, guess who stands right by your side? Not the enemy. He'll be accusing you over there somewhere, but Jesus. It's like, 
the best position to be in. You wouldn't want to be in any other position. So faith has to be unwrapped. How do I receive Christ and know that I truly have received him? Not just, oh, I said a prayer one day. That message really hit me and I was emotionally, and I, and I, and I said this prayer, but I walked away and now 10 years, five years, one year later, I don't know if it's stuck. Right? You ever feel that stuff? You ever ask those questions? Did I really get saved that day? Well, what's in your heart? Has your life been transformed? Have you... Maybe you just need to go back. Sit at the foot of the cross again. I mean, somebody who was like C.S. Lewis or one of these older guys that are great saints of the faith... I get saved daily. It's like, God, you just continue to blow me away daily with your goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace. Why would you love me so much after I did what I did today? I said yes to you yesterday, and then I did what I did. How can that be? But God, I pour out my sin. I thank you for your grace, your mercy. You see, you'll know. I knew because I grew up in church. I knew I believed the gospel to be true. But it never became relevant for me until I sat at the foot of the cross and realized that he died for me and that I need that so bad. And then from that day on, 1982, I mean, like I grew up in church. I went to church every Sunday. I don't probably did, I've missed church that many times in my life. And I heard the gospel day after day, week after week. I saw people living it. But at 21, I had to say, I don't know what side of the fence I'm on. Just because I knew it and I believed it was true didn't mean it was applied to my life until I knew, Jesus, I am so sorry and I am yours, all in. I need what you have to offer and I'm done playing with the enemy and I trust you. Then the growth process begins and the transformation begins as you daily trust Him and walk it out. But I knew that day I had crossed over. I was no longer living for myself. I was no longer living for sin. I was no longer, I'm just going to trust Jesus and rejoice in what He's done for me every day of my life. I'm not going to chase my dreams. I'm not going to chase being rich, chase worldly values. I'm going to chase Jesus and his dreams for me because he knows who I am. He created you. He wants better for you than you want for yourself, and he knows how to deliver it. The enemy's lying to you and offering you alternatives, but he cannot deliver, and he only is intent on your destruction. Who are you going to live for? Well, I'm not going to live for devil or Jesus. I'm going to live for myself. I'm going to, good luck with that. Your own self-righteousness, you're deceived. Because you see that the devil and, and God know this. There are only two camps. Oh, no, no. We think that there's this third, this gray area where we're good people, where it's like Jesus loves us and the devil leaves us alone. If we don't like recognize him, we're like cool right here in the middle. You know what that is? Deception. The devil knows this. There's only two camps, and there's one line. And you're mine or you're his. There ain't no middle ground where you're just kind of cool and you could be spiritual and worship angels and crystals and be a good guy and never, you know, there is no middle ground. It's a lie. And we lived there. I lived there. I went to church every Sunday and lived right there. I wasn't a bad guy. I'm not like killing people and like, I'm a good guy. I go to church. But I wasn't his. 
That was mine. The devil said, you're pretty cool. Stay right there. Played me like a fiddle. I was a puppet. I was deceived. Powerless. Until I said yes to Jesus. And I walked out of the cell. And I discovered freedom. And I'm telling you, this is the gospel truth. This has been preached all over the world since Jesus rose from the dead. This is what Paul preached in every city in the known world. And it's not changed. And it won't change. And I don't know where you are today. It's either foolishness, it's offensive, or it's the power and the beauty of God for your salvation. And I don't know where you are, but you know. And what would your answer be if you had to give that answer today? Why should you be allowed in? And are you looking forward to seeing God's face? Or are you still scared that all indicators of where you are? No, I'm cool. Well, no, I'm not. I'm in need of what only God can give me by his grace. And if you embrace that by faith, in a mustard seed of faith, it says, Jesus, I need you. He will receive you. He'll never turn you away. But it comes in humility. It comes with passion. You've got to hunger for it. You've got to see it. And if ever you get sidetracked, and, you know, we do. We get, you know, backslidden, and we get detoured in our spiritual walk. I'm telling you, where to go is right back to the cross. And you get on your knees, and you think about it one more time. You consider it deeply, and it will transform your life. That's why we take communion every week. It's the, it's, Jesus says, don't ever forget me, guys. And what I did for you, the blood I sacrificed for you, it meant life and freedom for you. Come back to me on your knees, and I'll lift you up. And I want to just offer that opportunity to you today. Come back to Jesus, all of us. Sinner and saint alike. And let's stay at the foot of the cross because that brings clarity to everything. So we're going to take communion. I'm going to have the, the front open. And you just worship Jesus and thank him for his grace and his beauty and his salvation. Or if you just need to come to Jesus, make a step. Make an intentional, prophetic, I'm coming to you, Jesus. And just come up here and pray and say, Lord, I need you, and thank you that you love me that much, that you would do what you did for me. Take me, Lord, shake me, break me, do whatever you need to do to get my attention on this issue so that I might live for you and stay free and never, keep, never fall back into the lie and the darkness and the deception. Keep me, Lord, living in reality. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of the gospel. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you for your willingness to take our place that we might be where we started back the original blueprint of who we are God and us created in your image together father son father daughter family free alive powerful beautiful, holy, and righteous. Father, you made that all possible because of your blood sacrificed for us and we were, recognize it, we commemorate it, we celebrate it, we want to take, Lord, this supper and remember your love for us, your sacrifice for us. Lord, bring your children home. Bring us all back closer to you at the cross where everything changes. In your name we pray, amen.